come now to the seventh of our lectures, exploring the life lessons that we learn from the great books. And in our first six, we went from the Roman Seneca to the humanist, Albert Schweitzer, exploring the question of the unconquerable human spirit that rises above all adversity. And now in our second section, we ask the question simply, how do we live our lives? How do we go from youth to old age? What, what issues confront us? And what lessons do we derive at each stage of our life from a great book? And it's one of the qualities of a great book that you can read it at different periods. And each time, your life experience will allow you to draw something new from it. And so we began by looking at youth. And one of the greatest of novels ever to celebrate youth, the follies of youth, the search for wisdom by youth, and the irrevocable decisions that we make as young people that may determine the whole rest of our lives. It's a theme I always pursue with my students. They are 21, 22 years of age, and I tell them, you are making decisions right now about a job, about going to graduate school, about going to medical school, about whom to marry. And these cannot be changed. They will always be there with you. Those grades upon the transcripts, the wife or husband you divorce, will still be there with you in your memory. And you must look at life very seriously. And no one took more life more seriously than the young Werther. And we talk about the novel written by Johann Wolfgang Goethe, celebrating the sufferings of the young Werther, or the sorrow of the young Werther. Die Leiden des jungen Werthers, it is called in German, and I don't strain the German language too much to say it might also be called the passion of the young Werther, both his love as well as his self-sacrifice in the name of love. But the author was the most famous literary figure of his day. Goethe lived from 1749 until 1832. He saw the American Revolution, which he applauded, the French Revolution and the rise of the great Napoleon, whom he admired, and lived on to see Europe shaken one more time by the revolutions of 1830. He was born in Frankfurt. His father was a successful businessman and saw to it that Goethe had the best possible education, first private tutors, learning Greek and Latin, also learning French and English quite well, becoming familiar with the literature of these great languages. But the father wanted Goethe to be a success in life. Goethe was of an artistic bent, and he wanted to be an artist, but his father said, no, go to law school. Fathers still tell their children that, as do mothers. So Goethe went to law school dutifully, but he didn't like it. He was fairly good at it, and he got his law degree, but he came back home and said, Dad, I really want to draw, and I want to write, write poetry. And the father said, I've read some of your poetry, and it's quite admirable, and you're already getting good critical reviews, but you can always write poetry, make money, go to be an attorney. So at the age of 24, again, very dutiful, Johann Wolfgang Goethe found himself in the little town of Wetzlar, in the valley of the beautiful river Lahn, a glorious area of Germany in the western part. And it was still part, of course, of that archaic system, the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. One time there was said to be some 365 political units under the rule of the Holy Roman Emperor sitting in Vienna ranging all the way from great kingdoms like Bavaria down to a single knight with just his castle and a horse. Each of these was an independent unity. And to all of them, there had to be a system of justice. And Wetzlar, a beautiful old town with half-timbered houses, was one of the places where courts were held for the Holy Roman Empire. And uh, Werther went, um, Goethe went out there. Werther is very much in his autobiography, but we'll call him Goethe. Goethe went out there and began to practice law. Uh, fairly successfully, but while he was there, he fell absolutely in love with the young Charlotte, Lotte, as she is called in German, a beautiful blue-eyed girl, and Goethe was absolutely in love with her. And it turned out, however, that she was engaged to another man, older than she, very respectable, and Goethe simply continued to pursue her until she finally broke off the relationship said, leave me alone, this is getting to be a public scandal, and go away from town. And so he did. 
but at the cost of tremendous emotional suffering. I ask my students again, has any of you been in a situation in which you would throw away everything just for love? And Goethe was so much in love with the beautiful Lotte that he seriously contemplated suicide. He was of a deeply melancholy disposition. And he took out a dagger, he said, time and time again, and would poke himself to see how far he could drive it in. But then he decided, no, instead of killing myself, I'm going to make a creative act. I'm going to do something, and I'm going to write about all this suffering. And in four weeks, he polished off the sufferings of the young Werther, pouring his whole story, all of his pain, into this novel of another young man. And it became an immediate success. Goethe was an overnight sensation because of this novel, The Sufferings of the Young Werther. It is in the format of an epistolary novel, that is to say, letters being written. And uh, Werther writing to his correspondent, Wilhelm. And Wilhelm is then the editor and begins with a short preface that he thinks the sufferings of the young Werther should be made known to the world so that this tragic story might prevent others from following in the footsteps of Werther to take their own life. So you know at the beginning what's going to happen to Werther. But the first letter in May of the year is all filled with sunshine and spring. It's the age of renewal, the time of that year when the buds come forth and the thaw comes about and Young Werther has moved to a little town on the lawn, in the Lawn Valley, a little town called Valheim, the place I would choose to live, it might be translated. And there he just wanders, enjoys nature, breathes deeply of nature, and celebrates a liberation of his soul from all the restrictions of society, and of his mind from all the restrictions of classical learning, and of an age which believed that nature was controllable, and that all laws could be known by reason. And he rejoices just in the sense of his own spirit and this uncontrollable, irrational love of nature. And the only book he says he needs is Homer, reading about the Odyssey and the wild story of the great war with Troy and the beautiful descriptions of nature that Homer already understood. And like the romantic poet Keats, he believes that he has looked into a whole new world when he first studies Homer. So with Homer in his hand and walking about the fields, he has put his law career far behind him. And he draws, he sketches. Pretty good at it, he thinks, and reads his Homer and sketches, drinks a little wine, and gets to know the local people. And in them, the ordinary peasant, there's such a joy for life and an understanding for life. And he immediately feels a kinship with him. He just sits down one day in a farmyard with a lady and her two little boys. And he said, may I draw your two little boys? And she says, yes, please go ahead. Here, take a little money, he says, and run off and buy some rolls and milk. And they treat him like a member of the family. And then he sees another young man walking along and he says, may I sketch you? And the young man says, yes. And the young man says, I am so happy, I am in love. And I am in love with the lady I work for. She's a widow and, and I just love her so much. And the very joy of his love made me feel good, Verda said. So in this midst of love, and he's walking along, and he has heard about this bailiff, a local man who owns a good deal of land and manages other land, and he wants to go visit him. He likes to go calling upon the local people and introduce himself, and he goes, and the bailiff is not there, but the daughter is there. Lotte is her name as well, Charlotte, Lotte. And she's taking care of her little brothers and sisters, her mother died some years before, and Lotte really runs the house. And from the first time he sees her, Werther is absolutely taken. He has been struck by the thunderbolt. She is the most beautiful person he has ever seen. And she is so good, you can just see the goodness coming out of her. And she tells him, there's a dance tonight, would you like to go with me? Oh, yes, I'd love to go with you, he says. And they go off in the carriage, and they find they have so much in common. Now, she's not a highly educated person, but they like the same literature. Do you like the Vicar of Wakefield? Oh, I love the Vicar of Wakefield. Oh, do you like the poetry of Klopstock? Oh, I love the poetry of Klopstock. And Verda begins to recite to her Klopstock's magnificent poem on nature and May and a beautiful May rain. And it starts raining right then, and they arrive at the dance. 
Oh, and how she can dance. I'm sometimes a little clumsy, Vera writes to Wilhelm, but that night it was as though I had wings on my feet. And we danced and we danced and we were the center of attention as we danced and danced. And um, a lady turned to me and said while I was getting a cup of punch, you're such a beautiful couple. She is a lovely young woman. She has run such a wonderful house for her father. She will make Albert a lovely wife. What? Albert? Who is Albert? Albert. Albert, very respected local businessman who was about eight years her elder, and uh, they're engaged. You didn't know that? She didn't tell you? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She must have told me. How can this be? But he is already totally in love with her. So now he begins to pursue her, and Albert conveniently is away. And she doesn't tell him no. And uh, their relationship, we might assume, is platonic. Nothing serious happening. And, uh, but uh, you know, he is infatuated with her, and she knows it. And he comes and sees her every day. They read Homer together. They take picnics together. He supervises the little children. Let the little children come on to me. They are nothing but a source of joy. And so he is so happy as we move into high summer. And then on into the late summer, as the days begin to grow shorter. And Albert comes home. But at first, it doesn't seem all that bad. He is much taken with Albert, there it is. And they strike up a friendship, a manly sort of friendship. And they take long walks together, and he's a regular visitor. Albert, Lottie, and Verda, they go everywhere together. And Albert can see a little bit that Verda is much taken with Lottie, but it's sort of a testimony to his own good taste. It all seems harmless enough. And Verda keeps writing of this, of his deepening passion, and he must have Lottie. He keeps writing again and again to his friend Wilhelm, who is a very sane person, a good lawyer. And he writes back and says, this is a crazy situation. You need to leave there, go somewhere, and start up a career. These drawings you send me, they're nice enough, but you're not an artist. You're not writing any poetry. You need to go somewhere and have a real career. You're going to come to a bad end there. And Lottie, too, encourages it to go away. It can't go any further between us, she says. And even Albert's becoming a little bit distant. So there the leaves. And he takes an administrative post with Count C. Everybody just has an initial in this, Count C. And he takes an administrative position there. And if there's one thing it's not that he is not suited for, it is to be a bureaucrat. He's a creative spirit. And he is always surprised when the Count, and particularly the Count's... Um, second in command, criticizes him for sloppy work or not getting work on time, and they simply don't understand his creative abilities. Well, he strikes up a new female relationship there, but with a very aristocratic young woman. In other words, as Lottie is unavailable, in fact, inaccessible, unobtainable, and he knows that when he starts going with Lottie, so this aristocratic young woman will never marry him. He's not of the right social group. But he starts a deep relationship with her. And then one day, he goes to dinner with the Count, but stays too long, and the aristocratic circle that comes every day on that week arrives. And they go home when they see this commoner, Verda, is there. And he pursues a young lady and says, why did you leave? And she says, you're an embarrassment to me. Don't you understand that? It's well enough for us to talk in private, but I can't be seen with somebody like you in public. You're a commoner. And she flares her aristocratic nostrils at him. And by this time, the count has suggested to him it would be better if he found other employment. So he's out of a job. He's failed as an artist. He's failed with Lotte. And now he's failed in his job. And he learns that Albert and Lotte have now married. They send him a little notice of their wedding. It's spring again, but there's no joy in this spring the way there had been the year before. He goes back to his old home, but nothing's the same there. And he is drawn irrepressibly back to Valheim, knowing it is destruction to go back to Valheim. But as high summer begins again, the time when he met Lotte, he goes back. And she tells him right off, it cannot be the same, that she is married. But he seems adjusted to this, and he strikes up his old friendship with Albert. And once again, they spend a great deal of time together. And frequently, Albert travels on business, and... Lotte entertains there, there alone, there at home, and is as free and open with him as she had always been, and they have delightful little moments that he writes to Wilhelm about. 
Oh, she had this little canary on her fingers, and the little bird kissed her. Then it flew over to me and kissed me. Oh, I'm in absolute heaven. One day I couldn't keep the engagement, and I sent a messenger over, and he came back and gave me her return note. And the very clothes he wore became sacred in my eyes because she had laid her eyes upon them. And the note, I kissed it again and again because she had touched it. And the suit I had met the first day I saw Lottie, the pale blue suit with the yellow vest, it began to wear out. So I had another one made just like it. But I keep the other one and kiss it every day because it was the one she first laid her hands upon. Well, you might snicker at this, but this is true love. And I would question if some of you have not been so devoted to a loved one just that way, that every moment away from her or him is pain, that every day brings only one thought that you will get up and see that beloved person. It's not unique in human history, and this must have struck a very persuasive notes in many who read the sufferings of the young Verda, the passion that had brought him such joy and yet such suffering, and they were intermingled. But his relationship now with Albert grows a little more strained. Albert asks him from time to time, why are you always hanging around here? I mean, I'm fine to be uh, convivial and to entertain you, but I mean, really, people are beginning to talk in this small town about your being over here all the time, particularly when I'm away. Now, Homer no longer even brings joy to Verda. He has been replaced in his mind, his heart, by the poems of Ossian. Now, I wonder how many of you have heard of Ossian. It came out with a great splash in the year 1765. Gaelic tales from the highlands collected and translated from the original Gaelic by James MacPherson. And these were wild highland lays, the Gaelic equivalent, the Scottish equivalent of the poems of Homer, but even deeper and more morose. Violent thunderstorms that shake the earth, blood feuds that go on generation after generation. And Europe was taken by them. Goethe was much taken by them. Now, from the beginning, there were those who questioned them. The great scholar and wit, uh, Dr. Samuel Johnson, said from the start, these are frauds. This MacPherson has written this poetry. It's very bad poetry, and it's totally fraudulent. He's trying to pass it off as new, as new Homeric lays. And someone asked him, do you think any man could write such beautiful poetry? And Dr. Johnson said, yes, many men, many women, many children. But Goethe believed they were real, and Verda loves them. So he begins to carry his Ossian around with him. And he tries to read it, and he gets to see Lottie again and again. And it's getting on now into the fall. And as the days grow shorter and shorter, reaching up towards Christmas time, he becomes ever more morose and ever more demanding in his time that he wants to spend with Lotte. And she becomes ever more reserved with him. She sees that his passion and love for her is turning into an obsession, and she doesn't know how to handle it. She has been rather careless with him, and now, now it is growing into an almost demonic possession with him. Finally, he comes to the home, and she says, Albert is going to be away the next three days. It is coming up towards Christmas. Do not see me again, I beg of you. Come and spend Christmas Day with us. And in Germany, that's a very special day, generally just for the family, the 25th. But come and spend Christmas Day with us. But please, don't see me before that time. And don't see me before Albert comes back. I beg of you. He's utterly distraught and goes home in complete misery. And he cannot stand it. And he goes back to the house the next night. Albert is away, and she doesn't want to let him in. But he's determined to come in and forces his way in. And she says, this cannot go on. You must, I pity you, but you must leave me alone. And then for the first time, he tries to take her, grabs her and kisses her roughly. And she pushes him away and says, leave me alone. And a terrible storm is blaring out in the night, shaking the house. And he says, let me stay just for a few minutes. She said, all right, stay, read something to me. I'll read you my translations of Ossian. Yes, read me your translations of Ossie. And he begins, page after page, about the terrible storm, the great blood feuds, and all the gales are dead. The last of the Gaelic warriors lays himself to rest upon his own sword. He will not outlive the people of his land. Gloomy thing for a gloomy night. She locks the door and says, go away. And he goes back home. And there, in the depths of his despair, he makes his decision. And suddenly all is clear with him. He writes one more last long letter to Wilhelm. 
It's all clear now. I see exactly what I must do. And now I am so happy. The next day, he sends a little note over to Albert saying, may I borrow your hunting pistols? Albert has come home from a business trip. It has not gone particularly well, and he's in a grumpy mood, and this messenger comes in, and Albert is talking with his wife, Lottie. Was there they're over here again last night. I have told you not to do that. I don't suspect you, darling, but this is very bad. What? Oh, a note from there that will he never leave us. What? He wants to borrow hunting pistols. He is going on a trip. Well, get them for him, Lottie, and send him a note wishing him a happy trip. And don't come back. No, leave that part out. Just wish him a happy trip. So she gives the two pistols to the uh, messenger, and he takes them over and gives them to Vertha. Vertha is dressed in his light blue coat, his light blue pants, the yellow vest that he has worn that first time he saw Lotte. And he asks the messenger, did Herr Albert give you these? And the messenger says, no, no. Frau Lotte gave them with her own hands. <gasps> her own hands. She is blessing me, he says, and he kisses them fervently. Then he takes care of some bills he has to pay. You know, frequently people, when they finally reach their decision about suicide, take care of all the small matters, their minds are completely free, pays his bills, writes one last letter. Then at midnight, puts the pistols to his head and fires them. A neighbor hears the sound. But he thinks it must be thunder, a flash of lightning perhaps, who knows? Thinks no more of it. And the servant comes in at six the next morning and finds Vertha lying there on the floor. Well, Vertha can't do anything right. He can't fall in love properly. He can't draw. He can't be a bureaucrat. And he can't kill himself. He is still alive. And he is lingering there. So they rush and get the doctor. The doctor comes bringing Lottie and Albert with him. And Goethe is there, with his, and Werther is there with his death rattle and dies on the bed. They take him in the dark of night with only the servant and no clergyman and bury him, a suicide in unconsecrated ground. And so the sufferings of the young Werther have come to an end. And this melodramatic tale swept Europe. People came just to see and shake Goethe's hand. He didn't have a job, and he didn't get a lot of money from Werther because uh, the copyrights law were such that all sorts of pirated editions were printed everywhere. But one day a message came in the mail from the Duke of Weimar, and he said, I so admire your work that I would like to meet you. Please come to my court. And Werther went. And the Duke, who was a little younger than uh, Goethe, said, I want you to be my tr most trusted aide. Anybody who can write a novel like that, you've captured all the essence of life. How many times have I identified with the young Verda? And I want you to be my counselor. And there Goethe would spend the rest of his life, climbing to ever greater fame. He was a very capable administrator, ran the dukedom very, very well, supervised the taxes, was ever trusted by the Duke, absolutely confidential and loyal to the Duke, but became the most celebrated intellect of Europe. Why he wrote his magnificent works on science there in Weimar, his Farb and Lera, his study about how color comes through his treatise in physics. He made studies of plants that influenced even Darwin. And he wrote his plays. He made his journey to Italy and captured the essence of the conflict between the romantic love of nature and the Middle Ages and the glorious love of classical antiquity and symmetry. And the conqueror, Napoleon, in the height of his fame, came to Weimar just to see Goethe. And Napoleon came to Goethe and said, I have read Werther seven times, and he wasn't alone in this. I carry it with me on all my campaigns. I had it with me in Egypt. He turns to his generals and says, Voila, num. there's a man, Goethe. Now tell me more about Werther and what deeper meaning you see in it. And Goethe said, I began to feel about Werther the way you would about a brother who was an embarrassment. He was always hanging around and people were always bringing him up. They'd come and talk to me, and I'd say, well, haven't you read my Italian journey? Yeah, I have. That's kind of hard going. But that Verda, when are you going to write another Verda? 
that was a great book. Write another one of those, why don't you? Have you read my farben, Leah? No, I haven't read about colors. I'm not very interested in science. Why don't you write a Veritha? That's all people would ever ask. Why, I would go and give a lecture, and they'd say, explain Veritha to us. But it was more serious than that. There the fever swept over Europe. And it was said by the authorities that hundreds, some even claimed thousands, of young men had killed themselves. Yes, having read Veritha and died in a blue suit with a yellow vest, a copy of Werther in their hands, struck down by love and taking him as their model. And Goethe himself bemoaned this Werther fever. But all through his life, he continued also, though, to grapple with this question of why do we live? And he had chosen to live, not to die as Werther had. He had thought about suicide, but put it away and said, I have a creative life to live. And he had joined the creative and the practical. But he continued to ask, why do we live? And how do we create? And why do we create? And so, in middle age, already famous, he came back to the theme and what he would regard as his greatest literary work, the Faust, and published the first part of it in 1808. And you'll recall, it begins with a contemplated suicide. The learned Herr Dr. Faust is there alone in his chambers, pondering on how he has studied philosophy, the law, even theology, I'm ashamed to say. Pondering, it all means nothing. I have learned only this. Learning only means pain, and we can never know anything. I am going to kill myself, and he takes a cup of poison out, looks upon it and says, all I have to do is to drink this down, and it's all over. But he doesn't. It's springtime, just the way it was springtime for Verda. The bells began to ring out, and he realizes it's Easter, and he puts down the poison and will make his pact with the devil to find and acquire all the things that he has missed in his youth devoted to learning. And what does he search for? The same thing Verda does, love. Not just worship, but uncontrollable lust. The same that Verda felt for Lotte. And he will destroy the beautiful, chaste young Gretchen and leave her to die in prison. The same way that Verda really threatened the destruction of Lotte. And Goethe continued to ponder this question. And as an old, old man, he published his last work, the second part of the Faust, in which Faust, too, has grown to old age and understands that all of his efforts have resulted in nothing. And on his deathbed, the devil comes to reclaim his soul. He has fulfilled his part of the bargain, he has given to Faust lust, he has given to him women, and he has given to him all earthly power. And now he comes to get his soul back. And Faust is saved not by any deed of his own, but by the intervention of the goddess of the Virgin Mary, the mother of God. And the last lines are, the eternal feminine draws us upward into salvation. And all through his life, Goethe had wondered about this question, derived inspiration from it, about how are we saved and the divine role of love. And the Verda remains for us, if we can go through the melodrama, a very enduring statement of the serious passions that every one of us as a young person feels or felt that make us in a situation in which we say it cannot get any worse. I am going to take an irrevocable action and put it all behind me. We see this tragedy all too often on television when some teenager bullied at school depressed by some outside event, 
decides to do some terrible deed to others and to themselves. And so Goethe calls us back and says, just with Winston Churchill, as long as there is life, there is hope.